conversation, just in general, because we all know 2014 is looming over our heads as we discussed on our table just now. It's happening. Uh, 2014 will come, whether we want it to or not. So <laughs> we figured we would try our best, put our heads together, and talk a little bit about what are some of the things that you should think about um, over the next you know, two years or so. And so I'll go through some general uh, talking points that I think you should you know, keep in your mind and think about. And I'll let, of course, our detail experts over here, they're the real blue ribbon folks over here, uh, to get into some of the details. But some things to think about. And you know what? It was nice after I put this together, hearing you guys talk. And most of what I'm about to put up, you guys figured out doing this project. And you're doing it, which is great. But collaboration. And I thought, maybe this was just hilarious, because we're all learning something new. But they figured out how to work together, so I figured we can do it too, right? Um, but your collaboration is key. And not just amongst the partners who are doing the work, but with the community. I think we have to keep bear in mind the recovery community or client-based community. The community in general um, plays a, a vital role in this integration piece. Uh, we have examples where people are saving costs using recovery coaches. Um, you know, so we've, we've got the, the evidence out there that shows that, that listening to the community and their needs and integrating them um, is a key part as well. So I don't know if you can figure out what this is, but this is not just, you know, Mumbo Jumbo. It's actually something that someone understands. I don't. But specialty knowledge is valuable. Um, and I know there are a lot of folks who have the concern that addictions are going to go away. You know, treatment world is going to go away. That's not the case. Your knowledge is valuable. No one else has that knowledge. How you use it, yes, that might change and will change. How you integrate, collaborate with others is going to change. But your specialty care knowledge is very valuable. And folks are going to want to use you in some form or fashion in this collaboration going forward. So know that. You, have a, you come from a place of strength as you're going forward in this integration process. Diversify funding. Uh, it will not look the same. You know, that's going to change. So you need to look at what are the new options. And of course, the others can, Elaine and, um, Aileen and, and Todd can talk about that a bit more. But what are the options and opportunities for collaborating more with others through grants, foundation funding, you've got you know, Medicaid and what other funding sources are out there, you've got to look at diversifying your funding. The block grant is not going to work the same way as it used to. So we need to understand that. Use technology. And this phone is not in production. I think some, someone just put this together, but it just shows you how far technology can take you. You've got a glass phone with some stuff on there. I don't even know what that is. But HIT is what everybody talks about. Um, and I was having a conversation, where was it? Was it with you? Yes, about how to use technology, uh, Marianne and I. And yes, HIT is one component of it, but if you can look at ways of streamlining the work that you do, um, increasing your staff time, uh, you know, reducing staff time on projects, they're more productive in a shorter space of time, they can use their other time on other projects. Uh, we talked about, in the case of doing this, this work, you know, Marianne's busy, she's, her role has changed, she's doing a lot more traveling. I'm trying to figure out how can she better use her time to keep engaged with her team back in the office when she's out. Technology is a way to do that. And I think there are many free, simple, cheap ways of using technology in a way to enhance the work that you're doing. So just being open-minded to that. And be open to change. And of course, this entire project was around, you know, the change process. And you've got two models that we spoke really to the change coaches that we trained on these two models. But we've got the HTC Tech Transfer model, um, and you've got the PDCA uh, model, and NITEC's the Rapid Cycle model. So it's understanding the entire change process, how to work within that, and someone who can coach you through that process. There's so many elements to change. It might look like this huge, you know, beast to tackle, but using the PDCA on specific changes, the small bites that we talked about, that gets you to the bigger change. You've got to start somewhere. Um, and that leads to uh, other, other changes. So integrate recovery-oriented care. And the picture doesn't actually, it doesn't seem to match the title. Uh, the sign above here says, the law must recognize the leading fact. Medical, not penal treatment reforms the drunkard. And you've got all these guys sitting around standing for this cause, right? We've come a long way from here. Mustaches. <laughs> yeah. I like the mustaches in there. I know. We should go back to that. <laughs> Maybe you. <laughs> well, we've come a long way. You know, we've come a really long way when it comes to treatment and recovery. And we're at this place now where you have folks who are in recovery who are giving back to the field in very meaningful ways. Um, to the folks who care about their bottom line, they're reducing costs for them. For the client, you've got a warm handoff, a warm person who's been through it who can give you their advice. Um, so we've come a really long way from 
these guys, you know, back in, I don't know when this was, but I don't have the date on here. So we've come a long way. I think just keeping recovery oriented care in mind is important as you go forward. Collect and use best practice data. Um, and I, the reason why we wanted to partner with Nitex on this is because they have a really good model for doing that in a quick way. It's not overwhelming. Literally on the back of a napkin, write some, you know, put some marks down and count it before and count it afterwards. But using data, I think a lot of folks in our field are really afraid of data. It seems like this, this beast, we collect a lot of it and we do nothing with it. And you've got this data sitting in a database somewhere, nobody's ever looked at it. If we actually figure out how to actually use our data in a meaningful way, in a clinical way, we can reduce our costs, improve our care, you know, and have less headaches really overall. But, you know, so use of uh, best practice data. And I want to say that's the last one, yeah. But these are the key things that I thought were pretty, you know, just keep in, keep in mind as you move forward. Um, and so with that said, I will hand it over to my, you know, esteemed colleagues. I'll let them take it from there. Well, I, I don't have a PowerPoint, um, so as I think about integration, I, I think about what, what are you, uh, where are you going to be a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, and how are you going to get there? So there are a few things that, that I know are going to be really important kind of as you step forward into the future, and things that can be kind of wrenching for behavioral health because they're really, they don't fit the way um, Behavioral health addictions treatment has typically, quote unquote, did, done business. Okay, and so it really is switching to a different business model. And you can do this. Uh, I, for one, don't think healthcare reform is going to be just here tomorrow. It really is going to take some time for everything to step into place. So you do have some time to incorporate these things. But I do think they're things that are extraordinarily important. But they're really doable. They're things that you have developed the skills to deal with. Okay. One of them is access, okay? Behavioral health addictions treatment has to move out of, uh, we're gonna schedule you into the future, you know, you call today and in two weeks we're gonna give you an appointment and then we're gonna admit you to the program a week or two be, you know, beyond that. You, if you're working in, a, in regular medical care, which is where you're gonna be, okay? Then there has to be much more immediate access, okay? And when I say immediate, I really mean immediate, same-day access um, to services, same-day access to treatment. We're not there in the organization that I work with, um, except in very small ways in my opinion, but I know that's something we have to achieve. So that's, that's a really critical component. But again, you can step into that. You can work on, uh, on access as a project um, and move from two and a half weeks to be there to two weeks and you know it's kind of like your example of we went from you know an hour and a half to almost four hours for some people down to 2.1 hours in an intake process those are critical things to be looking at so that re responsiveness to medical care increases your value it increases your value to insurance companies as well mm -hmm. Sorry. no go ahead uh, I guess I just wonder I realize why access is beneficial, mm -hmm. and I know that it's right. important, um, mm -hmm. and doctors want it, but then I think about like when I call to get a medical appointment mm -hmm. and they tell me it's in like a month or whatever, Right. I feel like there's a disconnect there, and I wonder like if that's just an expectation of the behavioral health side, or if that's going to change for them as well, or if maybe that's a completely separate thing because it's not I don't think I don't think they're separate, and I think that's a really good point. And as we move to medical homes, one of the things that a medical home model requires is same-day access uh, to care, okay? So it's not just a team mentality in terms of treatment, it's also resolving some of the access issues for primary health care as well. So the expectation is not peculiar to us. And I also don't think you can expect to go to same-day access tomorrow. Yeah, you know, so you have to think of it sort of like, how do I get there? Um, and even three to four days would be great, quite honestly. Um, you know, even if it's not same day. So when I say same day, eh, you know, probably on average, you know, it's it's a lot closer than where it is now. Outcomes, really focusing on looking at outcomes. And when I say outcomes again, I'm talking about clinical outcomes. So if you're working with a medical provider or you're working with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, one of the things that you can sell for you for a specialty care is I, I worked 
I provided addictions treatment services to 40 people and they came in at this level and after X amount of treatment they left on average at this other level okay so what you're doing is you're saying this is the clinical improvement in um, with respect to the individual that we provided services to I mean the whole healthcare field is moving to more of more cost-effective and outcomes driven care okay and that means from a payment perspective it also means from a sales perspective for the services that you deliver so if you can say to an insurer or, or a medical or a potential partner I can get your referrals in within three days and I provide um, a course of treatment that goes over two weeks or three weeks or whatever the framework is and we move people from this point clinically in terms of uh, to this other point clinically on average doesn't work for everybody but on average that's where we get people and they sustain it our relapse rates are X think about what that communicates to people I mean it's phenomenal right uh, and being able to cost that um, episode of care is going to become really important so so increasing kind of the d level of sophistication and uh, from a financial perspective and John uh, look at you and just think about um, you, you know being able to say okay this is the cost of that per person um, folding it into kind of the whole general medical uh, when you talk about addictions treatment that People with addictions use a phenomenal amount of inpatient and emergency room care, okay? So being able to provide some treatment and, and, and then have the statistics that really demonstrate you've had an impact on that is really important. Again, it's, and I think it will become more and more important as time goes on to be able to show cost impact. Um, but those outcomes, and it's not just process outcomes, it really is clinical outcomes. Uh, again, if you're looking at integration, it'll be, um, uh, you know, you improved people's uh, addictions outcome. I mean, they're, whatever that means, you know, whatever scale you're using, but also they're, uh, we've improved the following healthy behaviors, okay? They're eating better. They're not smoking the same way. They're more engaged with their community. And there are some measures that are now getting thrown out there that are, are I, I think, may help us set a standard. Uh, so that we're not all collecting discrete and different pieces of information, but there's some commonality in what we're looking at. Uh, and then uh, the whole issue of, of using uh, a good electronic medical record to be able to collect data and, and, and become part of, to the extent that you can, health information exchanges so that you have some ability to exchange data with other healthcare providers brings you into the mainstream and that's what we're talking about here with healthcare reform and so and it's an incredible opportunity to bring um, mental health addictions treatment into the mainstream of medical care and not just as a peripheral piece um, uh, I do think that some of the medical providers are going to start to pick up and deliver behavioral health um, services on their own but I don't think they can do what you guys do okay um, they can provide some basic services to people who don't have complex needs, but they don't have the capacity to work with people who have complex needs. And that's something that you can really develop and build um, a business case for. So that, um, so that there's, you know, I like Ryan's, that Ryan's point about specialty care. There's gonna be a need for specialty care going forward. In fact, there may be an increased need for specialty care as the base of insurance expands. Um, so your, need, your, your services will become more in demand rather than less. But I think we collectively have to develop some of those skills. Um, so anyway, so that's, I think it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Good. And then what I want to talk about a little bit is this continue the the slides I was showing you earlier about this health reform tool. If I can find it.
first presentation I use. So I'm going to do my to a different place. You have the Y Y version. Oh. Okay. Once you, you grab your, talking. grab your, if you could grab your handout, the, the one from the, from this morning that has the globe on it. Um, yeah, grab this handout and we can just go from there. And if you go to the, it's like the third, third page. At the top, they'll say health reform readiness. And um, it's, it's, let me talk about this a little bit and just, just continue the discussion I started this morning. The, 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 the tool here is a tool we developed in, in really a, a cool fashion that we had experts say, okay, this is what we think is needed. And then we had providers sort of respond back to us like, well, this is really what we anticipate is going to happen and this is what's practical. We got it? Woohoo! Thank you. And we came up with a, a few things. I'm going to try to make it. Oh, now, we came up with a, a few things. Uh, first, on the left there, you can see the building blocks. And these are the things we said, you know, these are going to be the things that are going to be pretty fundamental. Uh, first is, is a focus and emphasis on the patient and the family. And, and, and I heard that a lot in your presentations today. You know, what is it the patient needs? And, and how are we going to respond to it? And then, and then more and more, we're just, as a center, we're appreciating the role of family in, in healthcare. I mean, so, so we added that. The, the second of both of our presenters, Aileen and Ryan, uh, or both of our experts from our Blue Ribbon panel mentioned <laughs> evidence-based practices. I mean, so that's, um, and it's really funny because when I, when I worked with the hospital, uh, I, one of the things I would do being, I was in the quality department there, and one of my jobs was to help with managed care contracts. And, and really the two things they seem to want to know about, one is are you using evidence-based practices? It was just sort of a, it makes us feel better to know that you're, you're using them. And then the whole outcome piece that Aileen was talking about. I mean, because I think they appreciate getting outcomes isn't always e the easiest data to collect. So as a step back, you know, for to be able to say, yeah, we use evidence based, you know, that we use motivational interviewing, we use contingency management, you know, and, and we and oh by the way, we also you know track you know engagement and continuation rates just so we you know at the very least we know what's happening there. So evidence based practices. Accountability for patient care, that is exactly what Eileen was talking about, is knowing what happens to your patients, you know, either within treatment and ideally beyond. And then integrated continuum of care, that's been our whole collaborative here. You know, do you, do you have sort of a, 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 a wrapper, do you have a set of services that include mental health and primary care? And then on the right hand side was the organizational pieces. Do you have an engaged board of directors? Do you have people with proper certification? You know, and I know that's sort of a gradual process. You want to, right now, people are sort of playing the game of, okay, we know we're going to need certain levels of certification. You know, do we do it now or do we wait? But we need to sort of plan for it. I think even I think you folks were saying you're working with local universities, you know, to start getting at that. Patient record, that's code for EHR. You know, you know, and, and, and probably some people, every once in a while, they argue with me, well, isn't that a building block? It could be. It could very well be. Uh, outcomes, tracking of that. Um, when you start working with health insurance more, the quality management function is important. You know, to be able to say that you're doing continuous improvement, which in, in the essence you were doing in this project, and you have some data that you're collecting on a regular basis. Holistic care, you guys know about that. IT. And not just, uh, and really for us, IT administrative around billing and stuff like that, around human resources, and then also starting to get the patients using IT, 
whether it's through EHR, through handhelds and things like that. And I know that's, that's probably the most futuristic piece of this, but it's there and then finance, having a strong financial piece. So, we, we, we did, what we did is we had, we had this on our website, 276 organizations filled this out. And, and then we, we did analysis of this data that's going to be published probably in, in, in a few months here. And, uh, and, and we had a scale of early stages, uh, actually it needs to begin early stages on the way in advance. And the, the high scoring conditions were, I was going to have you guys guess, but since you had the piece of paper you would have known the answer, <laughs> you know, that would, you would have aced the test. Where people right now seem to be doing better is patient family role. And, and really with these, and, and I will say this is a bit of a disclaimer, the ones who did better scored a 1.6 like to 1.9, and, and this was a 0, a 1, a 2, and a 3. So really the ones who did better were in the early, between early stages and on the way. And by the way, this, this tool is on our website, so if you're looking at it like, yeah, I'd like to try that out, see how I do, you can do that. And so the ones that did better, patient family role, outcomes, and I think a lot of people are collecting outcome kind of data, but I think you know, between collecting data on you know completion rates and some of the stuff Aileen was talking about, there's quite a quite a piece there. Quality management, you know, the Niatex website. Usually people are doing stuff there in holistic care. The low scoring conditions where people didn't do so well is Board of Director Education. You guys, you guys have probably done a lot of Board of Director Education at this point, haven't you? To the degree you have them, yes. I mean, it's a lot of folks haven't. Workforce, EHR, and IT are the low scoring ones. Okay. Any surprises there on the lows and the highs? I mean, the EHR, the, the one we, when we're working with folks, that tends to be the, the one people are really focused on right now, and one of the tougher ones. It's, you need money for it. You know, so we, we talk about how do you get the money for it. The thing that concerned us in the data is, is it seemed like bigger organizations were in better position to address this than, than smaller. You know, and so we, when, we, when we sort of did, you know, by budget, we compared the, the small budget organizations compared to the high, you know, these are where we saw differences. And, and, um, and that, that actually was a, a, a huge concern of ours and something we've been telling every state, every governing body that we can talk to is that, you know, people need stuff like this to help get them up to speed, particularly the organizations with smaller budgets. So that's sort of the, the health, health reform for now. I, I guess two things I'd add is, is two things that really seem are going to have a, a big impact with health reform is these accountable care organizations and these health information networks. And, uh, and so I would, I would try to keep track of what's going on with that at the very least. And if you're a person like Aileen that's even willing to take a step further and try to impact the process, that's, that's really important, especially these health information networks because uh, in most states they're being developed in some way. And in most states, they're not including addiction or behavioral health. And so you have this real basic problem, don't you? If, if you're supposed to integrate your data with theirs and there's no way to do that, it sort of leaves you outside the party. And so that's, you know, we, we raise that issue whenever we can. And, 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 I, and we found in most instances when the people, when the behavioral health and addiction folks or, or behavioral health folks go to the table, they can get their voice heard, you know, but you have to be at the table. And uh, are you familiar with what's going on in Maryland around the health information network stuff? Same situation. It behavioral is? Behavioral health is not quite involved with that, you know. We're uh, trying to get there. And you guys have a really strong department, too. We do. Um, we are actually, there's an overhaul. We're using a whole new system. It's called a CRISP. Have you all heard about CRISP? And that's supposed to be the platform. There's some kind of um, a platform now or a structure. They call it the architect. It's has to, and, and they want it, 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 want, it needs to be 
um, um, evidently SAMHSA has, has these specifications or they have whatever it is that they're looking for. So when you're putting in, my understanding is you're putting in one of these systems or RIT, you want to make sure that um, it matches you know, to some degree. And I understand that the system we're looking at does it. There's a name for it, but I can't remember what it is, uh, does that. So there, there is some direction from SAMHSA as to what, you know, what direction they want this to go in, Good. which is, you know, which is as I'm, as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, we can talk about all these things, but, you know, I would just love to see somebody just come up with, say, okay, you're, in order for you to survive, you're going to need evidence-based practices. Mm -hmm. what, what are they? Just, you know, where they're all over the place, you know what I mean? So you choose which ones you're going to use. Yep. I mean, to me, motivational interviewing should be high on the list. Um, you know, so what are, you know, where is the list of, of these practices that these insurance companies are going to be looking for? You know, what are the important pieces? Workforce development, you know, you have with the workforce, you, know, you talk about credentialing, but on the other hand, um, what about competencies? You know, we do this whole thing where we train and hope. That, that, that's what Minkoff calls it, the train and hope approach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you train and then we say, okay, now how do you demonstrate that you're competent? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just because somebody has a degree or a, a, a credential by their name, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I'm a nurse. I spent two days taking my boards. Uh, and when I finished and got my degree, my, um, my, 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 uh, to be a registered nurse, I only met minimal standards. Everything I've learned in all my years has been through my work, you know? So, I don't know, I mean, I could take every one of those and, and say those kinds real. of things, but I, we just make it so broad sometimes. I think you, you raised some good points, uh, some excellent points, and I, but I also think that the points that you raise really speak to the need uh, because each state is different in terms of Medicaid design. There, there are a lot of differences. There are a lot of commonalities, okay? So, for instance, when you look at EHRs, you want one that's HL7 compliant. Otherwise, it's not going to talk to other health go. systems. That's what I mean. There are, there are states that have overcome the health information exchange barriers that are inherent in um, behavioral health versus primary health care. Maine is certainly one of them. There are some others. But I also think at the more local level, and at this point I really mean at the state level, there needs to be a real collaboration between the policy people at the state level who make the final decisions about, for instance, certification and licensure of staff, and the providers who have those staff in place um, so that there's sensitivity to how, to how do you help the providers make the transition through grandfathering, through training programs, all those things. But I, I really think a real um, trusting collaboration between the state policymakers, and that would include the Medicaid or um, individuals and you, and the provider community is critical to making this all work because that's where you're going to make those decisions. Which evidence-based practices are we going to accept as a group? Because you're right, there are a lot of them out there. Um, some are more portable than others. Um, and so making those decisions based on resources and goals uh, is, is important. And some um, take years to meet fidelity measures. And, and some do. And some are too expensive and if you, if you yeah, look at it from a reimbursement perspective. Intensive. Absolutely. So, so what is the best fit? I guess that's why. But I think that's where you have to have those conversations. How do you, um, how do you, they know the field. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can really use their expertise to help make those decisions and evaluate the options very critically. Well, we actually have so. done some of that. Mm -hmm. we, we have what's called the Supervisors Academy, and, and actually Linda Oney, who's with Danya now, was a, um, you know, a, one of the, the team members in that. Ah. We really came up with um, uh, 12 co-occurring competencies that 
just, you know, if we just focus on being co-occurring capable mm -hmm. and Absolutely. start from there. Mm -hmm. um, so we have pulled it together and, and we're doing this training in a room where we have addiction providers, mental health providers, and developmental disability mm -hmm. providers so that they can talk across systems. That's right. So we, we are doing, mm -hmm. you know, some of this, but I, I just, I don't know, I just think it's just, if it could just, it's not, I like to be tighter, a little tighter, you know? There's a lot, there's yeah. a lot here. No, and there, there is, and there are a lot uh, of decisions. MSB's points. practice is to follow to answer that mm -hmm. question. The National yeah. Quality Forum put together a list of five practices mm -hmm. that, and this is a group that insurance companies tend to track with. Right. They, they, they do stuff for general medical. And, uh, oh, what did I do? I didn't see. Oh, I did that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep, it's gone. So, so let's um, let's do this. Let's go ahead and take just like a ten minute break, just to sort of stretch the legs. Uh, Tamara says they're bringing us more food, oh, which yeah. I should. <laughs> so, so so you can you can do what you want with that, and then we'll and let's like I said, let's just take a quick ten minute break, and then we'll we'll go ahead and wrap up, and then over the next hour or so.